Hello everyone, this is Ted Bauman here, editor of Bauman Daily of the Bauman Letter and a Profit Switch. Before I start, uh, click on the little i-card uh, above my left hand shoulder or in the text below the description uh, to view the latest promotion for the Bauman Letter, which is yours to try. You have uh, a whole year to decide whether you like it or not. You get your money back uh, if it doesn't work out for you. So please uh, give me a try. We're, we're having a reasonably good run of things, even though the market is in turmoil, uh, as I'll discuss in a moment. But before I start, I just want to say I'm going to give a free subscription to the Bauman Letter for one year uh, to anybody who can identify where the logo, the design on my t-shirt comes from. It's got to be the first person. So post it in the comments. The first person who gets there will get a free subscription to the Bauman Letter for one year. Uh, let's see what you come up with, folks. Now, uh, today is not a sunny one in Atlanta, and it's uh, neither a sunny one in the markets. Fundamentally, the market has uh, gone through a, a, a mini correction. Uh, it's, it's, I'm recording this in mid-afternoon on Thursday. Uh, the market started off really badly this morning and uh, has picked up a little bit. There's been some, uh, you know, people have digested the news. They've reconsidered what's going on. But what I want to talk about today is why the market has had this pullback. Well, you'll recall that two weeks ago I released a video that said that the market was really like a mousetrap because it had become so dependent on public policy, namely the Fed, um, that if anything changed in public policy, the market would react quickly. I did say last week in my follow-up video that I didn't think that that would be the end of the world. It never is. Markets tend to rise in long-term bull trends despite the pullbacks uh, that, uh, that happen periodically. So today, I think what we're seeing is one of those kind of washout moments. Um, it, it has not so far turned into a rout. Uh, hopefully it won't, but let's talk about why the market pulled back today and what that might mean for the near future. Well, the first thing is that COVID is not over. Um, I'm a South African citizen and uh, I have a lot of friends and family down there that pay close attention to what happens. And I can tell you the only places where COVID is in retreat are in countries where the vaccine is available, where it is being distributed and where people are willing to take it. In countries that can't afford it or don't have the capacity to release it, at scale or where people are hesitant to take it, COVID is getting worse. And that's because of this Delta variant. Um, so there are a lot of fears in the market about Delta and psychologically one of the big turning points was when the, orga sorry, the organizers of the Japan Olympics um, said that they were not going to allow spectators this year, which is a huge psychological blow. And the Tokyo was going into lockdown. So I think the market, number one, is concerned whether or not we are actually going to see um, an emergence from COVID this year, which is sort of what everybody thought was going to happen earlier this year. We thought the economy, the global economy, is going to overheat. We'd have inflation. Now people are beginning to doubt that. I'll talk about that more in a moment. But there's a technical factor that caused, I think, the big snap this morning, and that has to do with the dollar and with uh, the bond yields. Here's a chart that shows 10-year bond yields. You can see that they dropped yesterday afternoon down to um, a low of about 1.3. Uh, that's 1.3, a yield on the 10-year um, this morning, when I first looked at the market, uh, the, the yields were, you know, around 1.26. They've since snapped back up today, uh, quite remarkably, actually. I mean, they've they bounced back big time um, since this morning's uh, trading started. But I, I, essentially what's happened, there was a big flight to the safety of Treasury bonds. And you can see it here. We're down to where we were back in February. Uh, and that means that the market is doubting that there actually is an inflationary threat and they're pricing in less growth than they did otherwise. Here's a second chart that shows the other part of this, which is the US dollar. Uh, we're heading towards a level of dollar value that uh, was very close to what we saw in March when we saw the huge pullback in stocks. Now, why is the dollar bad for US stocks? Because so many US companies earn um, their money in foreign currencies. And if those foreign currencies are worth less relative to the dollar, so are their overall earnings. That means that their forward earnings projections fall as the dollar rises. Now, um, that matters in the short term because a lot of people have been shorting uh, long duration treasuries like the 10 and the 30 year treasury bond. They'd also been shorting the dollar, expecting both of them to uh, move in opposite direction of where they're moving today. Because they're moving in the opposite direction, uh, those shorts have to cover their, themselves, which is why they're rushing out and buying treasury bonds, which pushes up their price and lowers their yield. So one of the factors is that there's a lot of shorting going on in critical markets like the dollar and in long duration treasuries. And when we get a snap reaction like we have today, that amplifies the initial reaction to that. Uh, and it's not good for the, um, you know, for the market. It's not good for stocks. However, uh, we've seen stocks start to recover a little bit today, and that's probably because the shorts have had their say. 
Second thing is, and this is the backdrop, I think a much more important backdrop to why stocks have pulled back, and that's market breadth. Here's a chart that shows the percentage of stocks uh, in the S&P 500 that are above their 20-day moving average. You'll see that it's at a, a, a low, really, for the year. It's, it's the lowest it has been since May, when we had another bit of a mini pullback. And what that tells us is that while the markets have been hitting new highs and setting new records every day, the majority of stocks are actually not doing that well. So all it took was that for the small number of mega cap stocks that have been setting new records like Apple and um, Amazon and uh, Alphabet and Facebook and others, now that they have pulled back today, that means that uh, it really kind of removes the clothing from the emperor. And we can now see that the market really isn't as healthy as a lot of people thought it was. And that has led to a broad based sell off today. Uh, the second way of looking at it is to look at small caps, which are traditionally the driver of the biggest gains in the short term. Here shows the IWM, which is a, a small cap ETF. And below it in blue is the number of those stocks that are above their 10 day moving average. And I've drawn a line between the low points, which are all below 30 per, or 30% of stocks who are trading below um, uh, their, uh, uh, or, or sorry, above their 10 day moving average, I should say rather. It shows that more than 70% of stocks are below their 10 day. That's the way to interpret it. But I've drawn a line that shows that every time that happens, every time we get down to the point where less than 30% of stocks are trading above their 10 day uh, MA, we then get a dip in the stock market. You can see the pullbacks very clearly. So this is, again, consistent with what we're seeing today. So what about the Fed? What's the Fed doing here? Well, you know, we know that the Fed earlier this year, uh, or rather last year, basically said that they were going to maintain a loose money policy um, in the face of potentially even higher inflation in order to try to get money into the pockets of American workers uh, to try to get inflation up so that wages could rise and rebalance the economy uh, at the income level. Now, um, everybody you know, has always said, well, what if they blink? And I think what's happened uh, in the last couple of weeks is that people have begun to wonder whether the Fed actually is blinking, or at least part of the Fed is blinking. And this goes back to what I said two weeks ago about the market being so dependent on the Fed. If the Fed um, is giving mixed signals, which I think is fair to say they are, um, then the market is on a hair trigger. Uh, the, the slightest little bit of information, like the release of the minutes of the Federal Open Market Committee meeting from a couple of weeks ago that just came out uh, this morning, if that happens, then people freak out and uh, then you get these wild swings in uh, the market. Um, but what I think what's happened now is that people are beginning to doubt um, or beginning to worry that the, that the Fed's commitment possibly to raising interest rates in even in 2023 or the end of 2022, which one Fed uh, governor said uh, he might uh, entertain, if they do that, it would be a mistake because the economy doesn't seem to be growing as fast as everybody thought it was. Here's some evidence of that. This is a chart that shows the, uh, the level of employment growth in the services sector, things like bars, restaurants, entertainment venues, uh, cruise ships, uh, casinos, etc., uh, so far, you can see that it's risen consistently since the beginning of the pandemic, but now it's pulled back big time. Now, so the fear here is that um, that the Fed might make a policy error by raising interest rates or tapering bond purchases too early. And in a sense, this goes back to something, I, again, I said two weeks ago, maybe the market is deliberately throwing a tantrum to try to throw a scare into the Fed to stop them from tapering. Because remember, by tapering, that means that they are releasing bonds and mortgage-backed securities onto the market, which increases their supply, which um, uh, should cause their price to fall, which causes yields to rise, which raises interest rates. So maybe uh, the market is actually um, on that hair trigger, reacting violently, saying, Fed, don't even think about it. Um, you know, we're sending the signal that we suspect that the economy is not growing as fast as it should be. And if it doesn't, then uh, we're going to throw a tiz and we're going to start selling stocks and then you're going to have to intervene again because as you know keeping the stock market high is the fed's number one priority isn't it no it's not it's not even a priority at all in terms of the law but uh, the market thinks that it should be and they've come to believe that it is last thing today let's talk about the so-called great unwind um, here's a chart that shows rises in asset prices relative to gdp over time this goes back to 1995 the left hand chart shows the ratio of house prices to um, uh, the consumer price index and then the ratio of the stock market to consumer price index going back to 1995. Now, um, in terms of the, the housing market, you can see that we're getting back up to the territory that we were in before the great housing crash of 19, uh, or sorry, uh, 2009. 
I don't think we're due for another crash in housing um, because the financial situation underlying the housing market, the um, you know, the securitized secondary mortgage market is a lot tighter. Derivatives are not as, as wild as they were back then. But nevertheless, um, loose money is driving up house prices um, relative to CPI in an unsustainable fashion. Uh, the, the lighter line, which is the stock market versus the CPI, is way out to lunch. It's been rising steadily since 19, uh, or sorry, 2009. A couple of small pullbacks, big one last year, but now we are in um, uncharted territory. So what this tells us is that uh, at a the level of all the big con con countries in the world, all the biggest economies, the OECD, our current uh, situation with respect to uh, assets, housing and stocks, is completely out of whack to, to the, the rest of history. And that means uh, that uh, Federal uh, Reserve and other central banks are under pressure to start unwinding that position. On the right-hand side is a chart that shows total wealth, which tends to be made up of stocks, uh, and housing for the most part. And look how it has spiked since COVID. It has gone up dramatically. And that again is because that the liquidity pumped into the market by the Fed has just got uh, way ahead of itself. And we have a, a, you know just an incredible uh, rise in the value of assets relative to economic growth and also relative to the well-being of the rest of the country. Now, what happens if this unwinds? This is what I talked about two weeks ago. If it unwinds, Stock prices have to fall because if you want those uh, the ratio of stock prices to CPI to get back to its normal range, stock prices have to fall. If you want the wealth to go back to its normal relationship to GDP, the value of houses and stocks has to fall. They, it just has to happen. That's the only way you can do it. And that will happen if the Fed and other central banks begin to withdraw liquidity. So the big question is, can they do this in an orderly fashion? Do they decide to do it all at once and just take the, the pain at once and have a short, sharp uh, global recession? Uh, or what's going to happen? The problem is that with COVID resurgent, um, the pressure is on all the central banks to do the opposite, to keep the money pump flowing, which just makes things worse. It just means that the price to pay further down the road is going to be higher. And I believe that's one of the main reasons that we're seeing a lot of skepticism in the stock market, because the concern is that the longer that this carries on, the longer that liquidity is so freely available, the longer that central banks are sucking uh, bonds and other fixed income instruments out of the market, um, the bigger the price to pay is going to be in the future. Again, that doesn't mean that when it happens, it'll be the end of the road, but it's going to be a big, short, sharp correction. I'm not going to say when it's going to happen, but I've given you in my video from two weeks ago things to look for. Watch the policy discussion, folks. That's where it all is. Anyway, this is uh, enough for me this week. I'll talk to you again next week. Ted Bauman signing off. And don't forget, first person who can tell me what this t-shirt means gets a free subscription to the Bauman Letter for you.